Oh, boy, I'm the worst predictor in the world. Don't ask me to <laughs> predict things. Uh, thank God I don't gamble. Hey! Welcome, everyone, to MASL Midweek with Michelle Jingris. I'm Michelle Jingris, and I am so excited to be joined this week by the editor of Front Row Soccer, Michael Lewis. Michael, you have covered every level of soccer from youth to pro, U.S. men, U.S. women's. Uh, MLS. I mean, the list goes on and on. And so we've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, but before we dive into just the evolution of the United States, the soccer in the U.S. in general, let's talk a little bit more about your past. You know, you started as a rookie writer in 1975, and we were exchanging some notes beforehand. And you, at first, maybe not to speak for you, but you were a little apprehensive about covering soccer. Um, and now it's kind of evolved into what, what you've been doing since. So, so take me through those early days when you first started covering the Rochester Lancers and, and how you got involved. Yeah, uh, I, well, a sports editor volunteered me for it. Uh, I was covering <laughs> high schools at the time, way back in 1975. And you know how long ago that was? We used typewriters. This was right before we started <laughs> using computers. So that's, we're talking Stone Age. Anyway, on a Friday night, I get <laughs> called over to an assistant sports editor's desk, and he has a pile of files in front of him, and he starts talking about the Rochester Lancers. And it's the one team I did not want to cover. Uh, they seem to be a headache off the field. I knew very little about soccer. I did not want to embarrass myself to the hundreds of thousands of readers of the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle. And as the conversation continued, and actually is more like a monologue on uh, Bill Parker, uh, by Bill Parker, the assistant sports editor. And I said, my Lord, I'm getting assigned the Rochester Lancers beat. And I'm a rookie writer, a promising writer. At the time, I think we had a one year um, situation where, you know, if you don't pass the muster after one year, they could fire you and you're mm -hmm. not going to turn down an assignment. So I said, yes. And, uh, you know, looking back at it, you know, I've always been an O. Henry fan with irony, and here I am today. I made a career out of this. Knock on wood, everything's continuing as well, too. Um, I never would have imagined uh, to be in this situation. I wanted to cover baseball, football, basketball, hockey, never soccer. But here I am, and I'm, I'm glad I didn't turn it down for so many reasons. One, I needed the job. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, okay, you mentioned early on, you know, and, and a very valid point that you didn't want to look like you didn't really know what you were talking about, especially with your readers early on, you know, you're trying to establish yourself uh, in this industry and, and in sports in general and sports writing. Um, so how did you kind of strike that balance? I mean, what did you do initially to try to learn the sport on the fly, but also still, you know, kind mm. of fake it till you make it kind of thing? Fortunately, we had two writers on the paper, an editor and a former writer that covered the team, that they weaned me along. I probably asked a billion and one questions, probably crazy questions. I know supposedly there's no such thing as a bad question. Um, there was no internet at the time. Soccer was not on TV. There was a program on the uh, public uh, network, public channel called Soccer Made in Germany. That was once a week. That was the prior week's game. So I, I went and bought some soccer books, the few that, that were out there. I tried to learn the rules. And you're not going to really understand the rules until you see the game. And mm -hmm. um, I, I just did a lot of homework. And you know, uh, the writers essentially held my hand in the early going until I started uh, figuring out things. And it took me about three years before I really felt comfortable covering the sport. Mm -hmm. Personalities is something else. You could always cover uh, players, coaches on features, but just to understand what's happening on the field, a different world. Absolutely. I, I can relate to that as well. I mean, I grew up playing basketball, played for most of my life, kind of always assumed when I got into this industry, I would cover basketball or mm -hmm. a mainstream, you know, football, something that was very easily accessible. Um, I ended up covering hockey. Uh, which is niche in its own way. And then I got into soccer and, and the same with, with Red Bulls, like covering uh, MLS. 
I didn't really feel comfortable in entering now my fifth, what will be my fifth year this upcoming season, but I didn't really feel comfortable with what I was saying or talking about really until the third year. And I relied so heavily on my broadcast team to kind of help me get through those first transitional years, especially one of them, Shep mm-hmm. Messing, uh, who we'll talk about a little bit as well. Um, but those those people were so val- and continue to just be so valuable. And you mentioned like the the no dumb question or no silly question, but when you're the one asking those questions, <laughs> you're very hyper aware of you know how uh, how basic some of them are, especially when you're talking to people who are are just been so immersed in the game for so many years. But um, their help for me was was just so valuable along the way to just kind of help my own progression. Um, so I can relate to you there, but let me pick it up with Shep because that was the mm-hmm. first game you ever covered. Uh, Shep was actually the goalie for the Boston Minutemen, I, I, I think, right? Yeah. Um, no. So what do you remember from, from covering that game, which I'm sure for you was a whirlwind? Um, what do you remember about Shep and about those teams? Well, it was an indoor soccer tournament. The North American Soccer League was thinking of starting a, an indoor league, and they had a series of regional tournaments that led up to a national Final Four. So they decided to have Rochester as the market for the Northeast. That included the New York Cosmos, Hartford Bicentennials, Lancers, and, of course, the Minutemen. And in the first game, uh, the Lancers played the Minutemen, uh, I remember seeing Shep's name on the uh, lineup sheet. I still have the program from that game. Um, much to the chagrin of my uh, of my wife, I save every program I've ever had. Um, but it's great for historical purposes as well, too. So I could, I could have double checked that. Um, the Minutemen beat the Lancers four to three that night. I wish I could say Messing stood on his head. He probably made some really uh, Shep probably made some really big saves in the game. Um, and actually, I felt probably more comfortable covering indoor soccer because it was like hockey, you know, in, in many, many ways. So, and, uh, and from there, I went to outdoors, and that's when uh, <laughs> the challenge was, became greater. But I, I managed, uh, managed my way uh, through the 1975 season, got through in one piece. Very good. And yes, I think it, I think it's safe to say that it all worked out for you. So you did what you had to do in that year <laughs> to continue yeah. your career co- covering soccer. Um, so you're actually writing a book. I, you may have finished the book now. I think it's actually out soon um, about the Lancers and, and that team. Why did you feel compelled to tell these stories and, and make a book about it? You know, years ago, I wanted to, to do a, a big magazine piece about the Lancers for the for the. Uh, Democrat and Chronicle, and it just grew from there. And of course, life gets in the way of things. And I, I wound up writing some other books about the World Cup, soccer for dummies and, and whatnot. And life, like I said, gets in the way. Oh, about seven or eight years ago, I just said, you know, this is a great story to tell. This is a story, essentially, the team was the antithesis of the New York Cosmos, the Cosmos owned by Warner Communications. Uh, millionaires, billionaires running the show. The Lancers were a community team. They um, they were owned by wealthy men in the area, uh, but they didn't have incredibly deep pockets. And players were playing for the love of the game in the beginning. They were getting $75, maybe $125 a game. At the time, that might have seemed like a lot of money. Today, it's peanuts, really. Um, and there were just so many incredible stories with this team. Um and we're talking about the team, have their official airplane for a few years in the early going. In the early days was a DC-3, which is one of these old um, planes that you might see in the movie Casablanca. Or you might have seen in the movie Major League, when uh, the, the baseball movie. And um, they were caught in a thunderstorm, and the players thought they were going to die during this, this time. Um, the, the team had 21 coaches over 14 years. Um, they had a player, Mike Stojanovic, a great player who wanted to be traded every year. He, every year I had a story about him wanting to be traded. The last year of the franchise, he says he uh, wants to stay next year. And guess what happens? The team folds. He winds up going to another team and, and, and does very, very well. It's, I think, an incredible story of survival passion 
and how soccer, how the so soccer world lived back then. It wasn't all the Cosmos. Mm -hmm. Not taking anything away from the Cosmos. It was rock and roll soccer. I enjoyed some of it as well, too, as maybe as an outsider. Saw a number of their championship games as well. Watched them on cable TV a lot. But uh, I thought it was an important story to be told. And I'm, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I finished it. Mm -hmm. And hopefully early 2022, um, it's going to come out. It's in production right now. And uh, we've been trying to do a copious job as possible, making sure we have all the T's crossed, the I's dotted, and all the quotes in the right order. Well, well done for finishing that. That's alive and kicking. So hopefully we can look forward to that in early 2022, like you mentioned. But you you hit on something that was interesting, and that's just the, the evolution of this soccer landscape. And, you know, you mentioned it, obviously, at the time, not only being about the Cosmos and now even more so, I think, as we've just seen so many leagues develop, like indoor soccer used to be all there was in America. And, and now we've just seen it completely overtake the u.s and i really feel like there's just been you know between mls usl all of the levels of outdoor soccer and indoor soccer now it's really like this next wave of popularity in the united states that we're seeing what can you speak to about that just from your time covering you know from its infancy to now um what are you noticing the most you know indoor soccer i think was a tether a line that when the NASL went out of business until the World Cup came here in MLS, it, it gave players a chance to play, to make a living, to follow mm -hmm. their dream. It might not have been outdoor soccer in the beginning. Some of these players became superb, excellent soccer players, legends. You mentioned Shep Messing. He backstopped the, the New York Arrows to four consecutive uh, major indoor soccer league championships, the first four of the league. And that helped open the door for the San Diego Soccers, who they're still around today. Maybe different mm -hmm. form, incarnation, different owners. But uh, I, I, I like tra uh, tradition. I like teams keeping names from the old days. I think uh, people it gives people a sense of history as well, too. Um, I know indoor soccer has gone through some uh, slim times, uh, but... I, I see it coming back, uh, especially with the, uh, the three gentlemen who have joined the league. I'm talking about Keith Tozer, Shep Messing, and J.P. Tele Telecamera. Uh, they have expertise in their own ways, and I'd like to think that they're going to figure out a way to get to move the indoor league, MASL, from mm -hmm. here to there. It's not going to happen overnight. I think, you know, as human beings, we want to see things happen immediately, but I think they mm -hmm. have game plan, um, short, medium, and long range. And uh, I, I hope that they get an opportunity to see that come to fruition. You know, mentioning just going back to, you, you said, you know, years ago, guys were playing just to make a living, you know, however they, they could, even if it wasn't a lot of money at the time. Uh, how have you noticed the homegrown product continue to kind of change, you know, as the years have gone on with, with also increasing opportunities for players, both men and women, to advance their careers. How have you noticed just, uh, I guess, at, at, from just United States in itself, just players being able to just get involved at a younger age and really start to, to have a real future here? You know, there are just so many levels that a player can play at. Not everyone could play in the NWSL or MLS or even EMASL, depending on mm -hmm. their interests and abilities. Uh, you've got so many minor leagues now, or excuse me, maybe lower divisions, I'll be nice, um, that they could at least live part of the dream. They might not become a star. Some might uh, move up the ladder. Uh, someone that I think of immediately is like Aaron Long of the, uh, of the Red mm -hmm. Bulls who played in the USL championship. And uh, also uh, Tyler Adams as well, too, who is in, mm -hmm. who's in Europe right now. Um, I, I know that situation might be unique because they played for a uh, an affiliate of an MLS team, but there are just so many more opportunities, I think, for players mm -hmm. out there. When I started in, in the NASL, there were so few players, American players or North American players playing that there was a rule that you needed at least one North American player on the field at all times. 
And I know some people might say, hey, MLS, there should be more American players performing right now. And I think that they have some valid points there. But there are so many more uh, American players performing in Europe and getting an opportunity to do their thing and make mm -hmm. some good money, too. I mean, I don't consider mm -hmm. myself an out-and-out -out capitalist, but there's nothing wrong about making a good living, especially <laughs> for a player who's their career might be five, maybe 10 years if they're fortunate. So yeah. uh, I'm talking about men and women getting a chance to play. Um, mm -hmm. You would have told me in 1990 that the U.S. women would have won the World Cup next year and would have dominated soccer for the next generation and a half, I would say. Really? You got to be kidding me. It's not like I didn't have confidence, uh, just did mm -hmm. not realize what the potential was we had at this level. And we've mm -hmm. obviously, obviously seen that potential realized. Yeah, I definitely. I mean, 100% with the women. And I think as the years have progressed now and, and even more and more recently, you're starting to see a lot of potential, hopefully with the U.S. men's national team as well. You mentioned a few of those players who are in Europe playing right now. But everyone has high expectations for this group as a whole. Where do you think they stand, um, you know, with the World Cup coming up? And, and also just who on that team are you looking to maybe make another step? Well, at the present time, they're in second place, one point behind Canada in the CONCACAF octagonal. Uh, I like to think the team is positioned in, in a good way. I think uh, mm -hmm. what happens in the January, February window against El Salvador, Canada, and Honduras will meet, will say a lot. Hopefully, the big thing about World Cup, and I actually put a story up today on Front Row Soccer, it's all about accruing points. It's not about playing beautiful soccer or anything like that. Mm. Um, I would like to think uh, head coach Greg Berhalter has position, positioned the team that uh, the games so that the games against Mexico and Costa Rica and Panama in March won't be do or die. I think the U.S. Mm. will get. Uh, what I'm saying is the U.S. will get over the the finish line. Um, you know, the big thing about going over to Europe is that yes, you're playing. You could be playing for a big team. You could be making big money. But are you playing all the time? And that that's that is a a, a gamble every player uh, makes. Uh, someone like Zach Steffen, who is the mm. back goalkeeper mm -hmm. for Manchester City and who's now, let's say, the starting keeper for the U.S., according to Greg Berhalter, who's, who started in the last few games. How does he get better if he's the backup goalkeeper? There's a limit of how many times he could um, improve in training. And, you know, will Zach Stefan get an opportunity? Will he take the leap maybe to another team? Maybe to a lesser team as well, too. I mean, being mm -hmm. with Manchester City, there are challenges – on and off the field that our other teams don't have. But it's mm -hmm. that, that is a question that he's got to answer. Maybe he has answered and things are happening behind the scenes. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back a little bit to indoor because you've covered it now for when you were, when you started in 1975, have you pretty much, did you pretty much cover it through the ebbs and flows of the different leagues and how they've kind of evolved into, into what it is today? Or did you take a break from it? And now you're you're back again. I took a break from it a few years ago. I okay. did come back in the early days. I um, I covered the uh, the arrows from Rochester with a more like a telescope because there were so many Rochester Lancer players on the arrows. The team had similar owners uh, or part owners of the Lancers were full owners of the arrows. So there was interest in mm -hmm. Rochester. So I made sure. There were write-ups of the various games. Um, I come from Long Island when I visited my parents on holidays or an excuse to see them. It was around the same time the Arrows played at the Nassau Coliseum. Hmm. And I got mm -hmm. a chance to do features about players. Buffalo Stallions uh, came into being. It was a scant 90-mile trip from Rochester, which was nothing. Uh, watched them play. Um, and the, the Arrows were stocked with recent Lancer players, the Stallions had former Lancer players. So you had a, some, a great rivalry, maybe not as good as Kansas City or St. Louis these days, but still a great rivalry because the players knew each mm -hmm. other over the years. And um, over the years, I got a chance to, to cover 
the indoor game locally and went nationally as well, too. Uh, went to a couple of championship series, sat in a TV uh, broadcast truck outside of uh, uh, the Civic Center in Baltimore for a San Diego Soccer's Baltimore Blast uh, game. I remember, um, I think Zungel had like six or seven assists in that game for San Diego. Um, it was a education for me on what happened inside the truck. One of my uh, one of my favorite <laughs> I've ever done, just because it was so different, and I mm-hmm. uh, so uh, and I, I think I was more concerned about what what was happening inside the truck than in the game. I mean, the game was a <laughs> blowout to the visitors and, and whatnot. But um, th- there's something special about the indoor game. Um, it is fast. It is for my aging eyes. I think it's faster than I I remember it. Uh, the game can change in seconds. I know outdoor soccer. I have learned do not, you know, something could happen in 30 seconds. The goal could be scored 30 seconds left in stoppage time. I mean, you turn around in indoor soccer, miss three seconds, and boom, a team is on a counterattack goal. Mm-hmm. And that is mm-hmm. uh, something that I think will will excite a certain amount of fans. I'm not certain mm-hmm. how many fans of the outdoor game or, or of the indoor game or vice versa – but there are fans who like that type of action. Well, that's a great that's a great point to make and, and a question I have for you. Where do you think indoor soccer currently as it stands right now kind of just, uh, I don't want to say ranks, ranks isn't the right word, but how, where does it sit in the overall soccer hmm. ecosystem in the United States? And with, with now so many different leagues that fans can kind of tune into and, and, and players to follow, right now currently, where do you think indoor soccer sits? You know, it's. Uh, I, I think it's a, a local and and, and a, a regional big deal for sure. It's a niche sport right at the moment. And as I said, you know, before about Keith Tozer, Shep Messing, and JP Della Camera finding the right formula to make it more national. Obviously, uh, the team, the league, had to pare down from 17 to 12 teams this year. I know they want to expand, and knowing the way they do their business. They want to make sure they get the right cities and owners. And that's not always Mm -hmm. an easy thing to find, but I, I see it as an area for growth. I think there's no doubt in my mind that people will wind up going out to watch the games. I know that there are a lot of fans here on Long Island that want to watch it. The Mm -hmm. problem down here is whether it's at the, the new arena in Elmont, New York, or the Nassau Coliseum, it, it does cost a lot to open the building. So you need someone with deep pockets. You could probably Mm -hmm. put a team here, have a competitive team, but you have an owner who's at the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. So you wrote season series previews on each division. Uh, Now there's a few games, you know, as the season, a little bit COVID's kind of played a, put a little dent in it, but uh, Mm -hmm. all of these teams have had a few games to kind of get their feet wet. What's standing out to you? Which teams are kind of emerging? And and is it kind of how you predicted it before the season started? Uh, Boy, I'm the worst predictor in the world. Don't ask me (laughs) to predict things. Uh, Thank God I don't gamble. That's that's. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, I figured the Kansas City Comets, I thought I had them uh, atop the, uh, the central division, and I hope I'm not putting the kibosh on them, but they're, they're three and oh, I, I just figured the, the team that they had returning a few uh, newcomers, uh, they, they could do very well in the regular season and go a long way. Um, I think the teams to watch in the Western conference, you've got, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the returning champions, San Diego soccers and, the uh, Ontario Fury, they played in the finals last year. Mm-hmm. And um, I think they're going to be neck and neck in the Western Conference all season long. Um, and who knows, maybe the way the playoffs are, maybe they wind up playing each other again in, in the championship mm-hmm. series. They've got some outstanding players uh, on both sides of the ball. Uh, you know, out in the East, uh, the Florida Tropics, I know they uh, mm-hmm. they had the most outstanding season uh, last in, in last year's or yeah. earlier this year, 2021 season. Um, and I see them as going far in the regular season and playoffs. And I probably just mentioned maybe the final four teams. 
uh, <laughs> the playoffs right now. Uh, I'll just give a warning: do not bet, do not listen to any of my predictions. Anyone who wants to put any money on it, because you might. Lose money. I was knocking on wood for you on the side, uh, so you're you. good. We're all good there. Um, just one last one, I guess, before we, you know, actually, I don't even know. We're at 25 minutes, but I think we should just keep going for a few more minutes because I have just a couple more questions to ask you. Um, okay. First of all, though, just players, you know, players that have stood out to you this year. I know you mentioned some of the elder statesmen, and I'm curious why, you know, I've noticed that as well. Some of the, the quote unquote older guys, you know, the over 30s. Um, why you think this year so many of them are playing so well and i wonder if it's it's the adaptability factor if it's you know the last year and a half has just been so strange with you know the having a shortened season and less teams and and i don't know what what do you think is the reason for that you know i think it comes obviously you've got to have the skill and ability that's the the bottom line and the passion to keep going too because and you have to have to be fortunate enough to have a the body, no injuries or serious injuries. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing that we forget about is every player plays with injuries or knocks, even when they're supposedly healthy. But I'm talking mm-hmm. about, you know, Ian Bennett of the Milwaukee Wave, um, mm-hmm. uh, Gibson of Kansas City Comets, uh, Frank Tejo of the Ontario Fury, and Nick Pereira of the Tacoma Stars. The uh, first two people I mentioned, uh, Bennett and Gibson, are like 37, 38 years old, which is mm-hmm. astounding. Um, they have all those qualities, uh, g- gifted abilities, um, injury-free for the most part, but they also mm-hmm. have experience. They've learned from the experience, good and bad. They know where to position themselves. They know when to run and when not to run. And it's not to expend useless energy, which they might have done when they were younger. And let's face it, you've also have to have a good supporting cast around you, too. Uh, mm-hmm. Way back in the day, you know, Steve Jungle, when he was scoring all those goals for the New York Arrows, it wasn't a one man show. He had a great supporting cast with him, with Luis Alberto, uh, Bronco Sagoda, Demir Shutevsky. Um, so you need good players around you as well, too. That combination, and let's face it, some of these players want to play in front of their children, too. Their children have come of age where they know that their father is in the the center of attention, and they want to play when the the kids will remember saying, hey, you were some player, Dad, or Dad, that was a great goal and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And uh, not too many players get that opportunity. And, um, you know, I've asked a few of them how – long they want to play and they want to play as long as they stay away from injuries and uh, they enjoy the game and they still are and uh, they're they're really fun to watch as well too I, I try to watch them to see their movements and their maybe lack of movements too because again experience figures mm-hmm. in factors in so much yeah absolutely I mean just having watched a few games myself just just to notice not only the you know, one thing that stands out is you mentioned you have to have the skill and the ability, but the technical aspect as well, how that changes when to go, when not to go, when to not exert unnecessary energy because it is such a fast paced game. I think that's one thing that comes with that experience that you're talking mm-hmm. about. Um, and also the work ethic. I mean, that's just second to none. It's something that, you know, you can't really teach work ethic. You either have that in you inherently um, or or you just you, you don't. And I think that's what separates some of these older guys that we're seeing still really able to make a real impact in this league, which is just a testament to their bodies and everything because of just how fast this game goes and, and just the level of physical shape that you have to be in to compete at this level. Um, so, okay, so that's kind of a look at, you know, where we presently sit with indoor soccer. So if you had to look into your crystal ball three to five years from now, as you, you know, and, and I'm very especially curious because, you were you were watching from afar for a little while, but now you're kind of back in and covering it. So, you know, where do you think this league goes from here, and and what are the steps that that you know maybe easy or not it, it still needs to take? You know, uh, I'd like to think that league will expand to sixteen to twenty, maybe to twenty teams eventually, um, maybe in some larger markets. I would love mm-hmm. to see a team in the metropolitan area. Yes. Uh, from my selfish standpoint, I would love to see something on Long Island, but if it's in 
New York, New Jersey, or Westchester, or whatever, that, that's fine too. And again, it could be economical. And, that. and the exactly. ownership, right? It has to be the right balance, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I like the fact that the league is in Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I hope it gets a, an opportunity to, to return to Canada and maybe after the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, when travel restrictions are going to be different, it, it will. Um, I'd like to see, you know, growth uh, in attendance, obviously. There are some really mm -hmm. big areas, indoor soccer. People are, are crazy about the game. San Diego, um, Milwaukee, Kansas City, Baltimore, mm -hmm. uh, among others. Uh, I, I'd love to see, um, obviously, them grow, but also the rest of the league grow as well, too. Uh, we're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, averaging – maybe filling up arenas again, maybe going to larger arenas. Um, mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong about playing in smaller arenas because you you really feel that um, environment. You know, the fans are on, on, on top of the action. They don't get lost in, in the shuffle and, and whatnot. But if, you're, if you want to grow the league, they're eventually going to probably have to go to larger arenas uh, as mm -hmm. well, too. So like I'm saying, Hopefully, eventually, 16 teams. Hopefully, it's not done just to add teams. Soccer leagues have done that before. The North American Soccer mm -hmm. League, that led to its demise way back in the day. Um, and, and like I said, I, I like to think the, the leadership is looking into all these factors. And hopefully, uh, the league will grow, will grow and go from there. All right. Great stuff. Michael Lewis, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, this was a, a very, very interesting chat. It was great to get to pick your brain a little bit. And alive and kicking, we have something to look forward to in 2022. I'm holding you to that one, okay? I, uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we're, we're closer than you think. Um, I wish okay. it was out by now. Uh, but thank okay. you very much. Happy yes, New Year. of course. Thank you. Happy New Year to you as well. This was MASL Midweek with Michelle Jengers. You can catch these episodes every Wednesday right here. We'll see you again next week.